When the prospect says, I need to talk with my spouse, if you sell business to consumer, or if you sell B2B and they say, I need to talk to my other partners, the board, the CFO, whoever it is, could be varies in different industries. Why is that? So first of all, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna talk first uh, about how to handle the B2C portion. I need to talk to my spouse. And then second of all, I'm gonna go over the B2B portion of if you're in B2B sales, how is it different when they say, I want to talk, I need to talk with the board, I need to talk to division heads, department heads, CFO, CFO, and I'll get back to you. Because there are major differences in how you respond to that, okay? For different reasons. Now, first of all, let's address why you're getting the objection in the first place. Because I'm going to show you how to overcome it, but why not learn how to prevent it from happening a lot of the times? I'd rather prevent it than try to overcome it. It just seems way easier, okay? All right. Now, reason number one. Here's the reason why you're getting this objection. Reason number one is you haven't yet, you haven't learned how to pull out enough emotion from the questions you're asking. So that means the questions you're asking are too surface level and your prospects are not emotionally opening up and telling you what their real problems are. They're not doing that. They're emotionally shutting down because you're triggering sales resistance by what you're saying and or not asking. Okay. And so what that is causing is it's causing them to not clearly see in their mind what problems they have and what their objective is, where they want to go. They're not seeing a gap. You're not, you haven't learned yet. Now these are skills you can acquire and learn. We have them all in our virtual training courses. Our clients know all this. That's why they're crushing you and your industry. Okay. You haven't learned how to build the gap with the newfound problem. So what that means is we call this their current state. So this is their current situation. Some people call it their current state. This is where they are now. We have to know the right questions to help them find out really where they're at right now. What is their current situation? What's their current state? Most, people, most of your prospects don't realize where they're at. We also then have to help them see what their future is gonna look like once all these newfound problems are solved. Now what's the gap between where they are compared to where they want to be? The gap is only determined, let me repeat this, is only determined by your questioning skills that allow them to see how big of a gap that is. If your questioning is off, that means the gap becomes much smaller in their mind. And that means the problem doesn't really look that bad compared to, wow, your service or product is this much? The problem's not bad now. You haven't built a gap. The bigger that gap is, the cheaper your solution seems when they see that big of a gap from where they are compared to where they want to be. Okay, that is only determined by you learning questions that work with human behavior, not surface level consulting questions that have been around for 50, 60 years. Everybody knows what those are, okay? Now, because of that, at that point, they are just most of the time telling you, I want to talk, so we're gonna talk about the spouse concern first, then the B2B stuff second. Most of the time when they say, I want to talk to my spouse, that is not their real objection. That is a smokescreen objection. It's just like if they say, I want to think it over. That's not a real objection. They're not just sitting around for weeks straight. I'm thinking it over. I'm thinking all the pause. Nobody does that. They have a concern. They're not wanting to tell you and open up to you. So they're telling you, I need to think it over or I need to talk with my spouse. It's a convenient one because so many salespeople believe them when they say that, that that's what they're going to do. The reality is, is 70% of your prospects don't even, that's not even their real objection when they say, I want, to, I want to talk with my spouse, okay? They have a real concern behind that. You need to find out what their real concern actually is. That's the first reason. Now, the second reason they give you that objection is just pur purely logistical. Maybe they needed to get with their spouse to move funds around, see where they're going to get the funds. It's just a logistical reason, okay? Or... Every once in a while, the spouse really, really wants to do it, but let's say they almost got a divorce last week because they made some big buying decision and the spouse almost divorced them, so they're like, I've got to talk with my spouse. That doesn't happen a lot. Just, you know, that's maybe 20% of the time, okay? Now, based on how that call went with their tonality that you have to learn how to read, we teach all that in our virtual training platforms, their body language, if you see them, maybe on Zoom or in person, or the answers they're giving to your questions, how much they're actually opening up to you, will tell you which of those two categories they're actually in, okay? So no matter which one they fall into, 
your original reaction is gonna be pretty similar on this, okay? You simply want to first acknowledge what they said. You can't sweep it underneath the rug. And then I'm gonna say something that's gonna sound counterproductive and I'm gonna tell you why. And then I'm gonna come back around and show you how to do this. You're simply gonna acknowledge what they said and then set up a time the next day or ideally a day after to talk to either them or ideally both of them, which helps disarm them because they think you're about to leave which you're not, but you want them to disarm first. Okay, so I'm gonna show you why you're gonna do that, and then I'm gonna show you, once you have an appointment set, how you're then gonna ask one last question that then is going to let them feel comfortable enough to answer and tell you what their real objection is. And then most of the time you can sit there and resolve it, and you can make the sale, and you don't have to even make the next appointment because they've already bought, okay? So I'm gonna show you how that framework works. Now, first of all, like I said, I'm gonna show you the framework for B to C sales first, and I'm gonna give you a generic version, and then I'm gonna give you two or three different industry specific versions. We train 158 industries on planet Earth. Guess how many industries there are on planet Earth? According to Forbes, there's 158, and then there's subsets of those. We, are tr we train in every one of those at this point, okay? So I can't give you 158 different industry examples and subsets in the next 20 minutes, so I'm gonna show you a generic version that will help you plug in what you sell, I'm going to give you the format, which all of that and about one billionth percent more is in our virtual training courses. I'm going to give you a little derve, and then I'm going to show you two or three industry-specific examples for B2C, and then I'm going to show you a couple of B2B examples and how it's a little bit, it's quite a bit different. So I'm going to show you the differences in that, okay? Now, once again, works for any product or service industry. doesn't matter what you sell at this point. We're in every industry we train. Now, let's give you the generic version first. Write this down, okay? Here we go. Rasmick said, oh, you know, James, this sounds really good, but, you know, I just need to talk to my spouse because we, we always make these decisions together as a family. How many of you get that objection? How many sales do you lose every week because of that objection? And be real, be real. I know you lose lots of sales because of that. Okay, here's how you're going to respond to that. You're first going to acknowledge that. You're going to say, yeah, that's not a problem. You're just going to agree with them. The first thing we have to do is disarm them. What do most salespeople do? Well, well, but, but uh, I mean, why do you need to talk with your spouse? I thought you said that you, you really know that this is going to help you. I mean, this is going to help you. Like, why do you need to talk with your spouse? And they just emotionally shut down. You might as well just hang up the phone or leave the, leave the Zoom or, or leave the home if you're selling B2C at that point because they're going to emotionally shut down. You want to disarm them first. So you simply agree with them first. So you're going to say, yeah, that's not a problem. How does, your, how does your spouse feel about you? And then you're going to repeat back what they said they wanted. So you're first going to agree, and then you're going to ask this question. Now, like I said, this is a generic example first. You're going to plug it in. I'm going to give you the formula. Then I'm going to show you some industry-specific examples so you can see how it works, okay? Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, how does your spouse feel about you? And then you're going to repeat back what they said they wanted, okay? Now, prospect says, Oh, yeah, I think they, they would want me to do this, but I've got to ask them first. Then you're going to say this. This is a consequence question. Yeah, I understand. I guess what will happen, though, if you go to them and they don't want you to get the fund, you can say funds, depending on what you sell. You can say funding. It depends on if you're B2B or B2C. Let's just say if you're B2C, you're going to say funds. Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, yeah, that's not a problem. How does your, how does your spouse feel about you back what they said they wanted. Oh yeah, I think they'd want me to do this, but I, you know, I need to really talk with them first. Yeah, I understand. I guess what, what would happen though if you go to them and they don't want you to get the funds so that you can, and then you're going to repeat back the benefit, the end result of what they're after. And it's going to depend on the industry you're in, which I'm going to show you some industry specific examples. Okay, yeah, that, I, can, I can appreciate that. I guess what will happen if you go to her and she doesn't want you to get the funding so that you can, and you're going to repeat back the end result. See how that formula works? Prospect says, I understand. I, I'm just not sure what they're going to say about this. Okay, well, how will, you, how will you be able to blank if they don't want you to get the funds so that you can, and then are going to repeat back the end result they wanted? So how will you blank if they don't give you the funds so that you can, and then I'm going to repeat back the end result. Once, I, once again, this is a generic example. I'm going to show you industry specifics in a minute so you can see the whole thing in action. It'll make more sense to you. 
Now, if you still can't get them to overcome this at that point, which is about half and half you can do, because a lot of times they're like, oh, well, no, 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 I'm definitely gonna do it for sure. You know, sometimes they'll say that and then you can just move them forward. Other times like, no, I just can't, I'm not sure. Then you're gonna book appointment to disarm them. And then as you're leaving off Zoom, off the phone, out of the office or in the home, you're gonna ask one last question to find out what their real objection is. I'm gonna show you that in a second, okay? So you're gonna say, okay, I understand. I guess what's your time frame on getting back with me later today or tomorrow just to see if I'd be available for you? Now, when you say just to see if I'd be available for you, what does that do? It positions you as the expert, someone who's busy, not just some salesperson who's at their beck and call because you're desperate for a sale. You don't need them. You're the expert. Prospect says, well, I could call you back in a few days. Then you're going to say this because you can't have any waffling. You have to have a book time. Well, yeah, I'm not sure if I'd be randomly available like that um, with my schedule. Um, what I can do though, if it helps you is if you have your calendar handy, I can pull up mine and have you book a specific time with me in the next day or so. Um, so you don't have to chase me down and vice versa. Would that help you or would that be appropriate? And then you're going to book the specific time. Notice I said that way you don't have to chase me down and vice versa. Why would I say that? That's called an NEPQ status frame. It's a status frame. It positions you once again as the expert, helping other clients solve their problems, getting them results, so it's attractive to your prospects. Not like, okay, when can I call you back? Okay, Sunday at, at 9 p.m. at night? Okay, I'll call you then, Bill. They're not gonna be there. They, you just look like a salesperson. You look desperate. You just lowered your status in their mind. You just look like some creepy salesperson trying to stuff your solution down their throat. You want to establish a status frame, which you had to do in the discovery part of that conversation. But this is another way to do that when you're booking a call. So it's called an NPQ status frame. Teach all of those. It's just a little example of one. Teach all those in our virtual training platforms. All right. Now, this is the th so when you have the meeting booked, You've disarmed them because they think you're going to leave. They think you're getting off the phone. They think you're getting off Zoom. They think you're leaving their home. They think you're leaving their office depending on where you're selling, okay? They think you're leaving, so their guard is down and you're gonna say this. Now, um, Cindy, before I go, what parts of what we went over do you feel like you need to discuss with your spouse just so I know what questions you guys will have when we talk tomorrow? Let me repeat that, because I know you're not gonna remember that. Now, before I go, see, you're leaving. You're going out the door, you're getting off soon. Now, hey, before I go, what parts of what we went over do you feel like you need to discuss with your spouse just so I know what questions you guys have when we talk tomorrow? And guess what they're gonna say? They're gonna tell you their real objection. This is where it's gonna come out. They're gonna say, well, I just really need to talk with her, him to see if we have the budget for this. Now you know what the real objection is. It's the money objection. They just said, I want to talk to my spouse. That's not the real objection. The real objection is they don't know if they have the money or they, they're not, they have so much fear in their mind that the money they're going to pay you is going to be wasted and they're not going to get the result. Now you know what the real objection is. Now, hey, before I go, what parts of what we went over do you feel like you need to discuss with your spouse just so I know what questions you guys have when we talk tomorrow? Now, it could be, well, I just really need to talk with them about the money. I'm not sure we can get the money. Or I just need to talk with her to see if we have the time to do this, depending on what you sell. That could be a time objection. Well, I just really need to discuss with her, you know, to see if, if we even really need this right now. And they don't feel like they need it. There's not enough gap. So whatever they say, you know that's the real objection. And then you're right there rather than trying to wait for them because maybe they don't show up the next day, okay? So then at that point, you're right there. You know what their objection is. You can clarify it, discuss it, and then you're going to ask what are called NEPQ diffusing questions, which we teach in our virtual training programs, and then most of the time, close the deal right there. And worst case scenario, maybe 20, 30% of the time, if you still can't overcome it and they still have to talk with the spouse, at least you have a booked, scheduled next appointment a day or two out. Okay, that, that's a generic example. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a few industry-specific examples for B2C and then B2B, because there are differences, quite a few differences. I'm going to show you. 
So write these down. These will help you guys kind of get it in your mind like, oh, I see how that works, okay? All right, now, like I said, most of the time when you follow this structure, you can resolve the concern at that appointment or call instead of having to do a reschedule. But it's just their res having a second booked appointment is mainly to disarm them because they think you're leaving, so they feel more comfortable telling you what their real objection is. And if for some reason you can't help them overcome it, at least you have plan B, which is the booked next call. But that is always plan B. Plan A is to help them resolve it there, nine out of 10 times, okay? Now, and it depends on what industry you, it depends on what industry and depends on what you sell, especially your price points. If you're in a B2B, a B2C type of sale where it's maybe 500 bucks or 1,000 or 5,000, that's gonna be completely different if you're in a B2B sales environment selling to enterprise and you're selling solutions that are 500,000 or a million dollars plus that needs to go through the board and legal. So obviously there are gonna be some differences there. So I'm gonna show you a few B2C, then I'm gonna show you a few B2B, okay? Now, in this example, this I'm gonna give you a couple industry-specific examples here so you can see it. This first example, let's say that you sell some type of coaching or training program that teaches people how to start and scale an Amazon uh, business. Train a lot of companies in that space, like business opportunity as well. So their main problems are they wanna make more money, they wanna have more time, okay? So let me run this through and you're gonna see how this works. Uh, prospect says, ah, this sounds really good, Barry, but I, you know, I just really, I, 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 really, uh, I really need to talk with my spouse. Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, how does your spouse feel about you starting your own business so you guys can make more money for the family? Now, why would I say that for that industry? Because the two problems I'm solving is they wanna make more money and they wanna have more time. So I'm incorporating that in. Yeah, that's not a problem. How does your spouse feel about you starting your own business so you can have more time at home with the kids? If that was their problem. They wanna start a business so they can, see? How does your spouse feel about blank so that you can blank? See, I plug that in. Most of the time they're gonna be like, oh, I think they would like that. Well, okay, but what happens if you go to marry and they don't want you to get the funding to put it in the business so you can make more money. Like what would happen then? See, that's a consequence question. Well, I don't know, I guess I'd have to figure something out, I'm not sure. Well, if you don't get the funding together, how would you be able to start your own business so you can get out of your job to have with your time with your kids? So if you're not able to get the funding together through her, how would you be able to start your own business where you can get out of your job so you have more time? It's the how-to consequence question. It's a double consequence question, okay? You're asking double consequence questions here to help them realize that if they don't get the funding, if they don't get the funding, they don't get what they want, okay? If they don't get the funding, they don't get what they want. If they get the funding, they get what they want. We also repeat back the second benefit they said they wanted, which in this example, since you sell some type of business opportunity, let's say it's a franchise or Amazon training or real estate training, let's say their biggest thing is they wanna start a business where they can have more time with their kids, so I repeat that back. Then the prospect's gonna come back, typically, most of the time, there are variances, which we don't have time to go through that, and they come back and say, yeah, I'm gonna to have to do something, I just need to talk to them first. Okay, now, since I couldn't overcome it, I then want to disarm them because there's probably another, the real objection behind, I wanna find out. So I'm gonna disarm them now. Well, okay, what's your, t yeah, that's not a problem, I understand. Which, I guess what's your time frame on getting back to me in the next day or two just to see if I'd be available for you? Well, I could call you back, uh, I don't know, maybe later this week, Thursday, Friday. Well, I don't know if I'd be randomly available like that with my schedule. Um, what, I, what I can do though, Bill, if you have your calendar handy, I can pull up mine and have you book a specific time with me um, that way you don't have to chase me down and vice versa. Would that help you more? See how I position? Status frame. That way you don't have to chase me down and vice versa. Would that help you? See, I'm acting like it's a privilege for you to even book with me the next time because I'm busy. I'm helping all these other people solve their problems. Okay? Now, people are going to be like, yeah, yeah, okay. And you're going to book a specific time. Now, here's the key. Okay? Here's what we're changing right here. Remember, we're about to go. So you book the specific time. They think you're leaving. They think you're leaving the home, leaving the office, leaving the Zoom call, leaving the phone call, however you're talking to the prospect, leaving the doorstep. If you sell door-to-door, -door, it's all the same. And you're simply going to say, now, hey, before I go, 
what parts of what we went over do you feel like you need to discuss with your spouse just so I know what questions you guys have when we talk in two days. Well, I just really need to discuss with him if we really have the time to do this right now. That's the real objection. They don't think they have enough time to do this right now. Okay, and that would make sense for that type of industry because those type of people have to go through training to learn how to set up and run a business like that. So that industry is going to get the time objection quite a bit. Now I know what the real objection is. It's not really talking to the spouse. It's do they have time? That's their objection. Now I know that I need to clarify that, find out what's behind it, discuss it, then ask diffusing, any PQ diffusing questions to help them overcome it. Okay. Now let's say that you still can't overcome it. And worst case scenario, you have the next appointment the next day. How do you begin that call with that person? Or let's say, they, let's say that they talked with the spouse, but the spouse is at work, so you have the appointment with the, the wife the next day. They talk with the husband. You, how do you start off that call? Okay, uh, yeah, it looks like we were just getting back to you. I think, uh, how does, I guess, okay, so you talk with your spouse. How does your spouse feel about you starting your own business so you can make more money? And I just repeat it back. Yeah, I'm, I'm associating them getting the funds with getting what they want. If they can't get the funding, they don't get what they want. And that's how people start to think results-based thinking over price or cost-based thinking. You have to align the money, the funds, the funding with solving the problem and getting the results they want. If we don't do that, they have nothing to associate what that money does for them. Okay, see how that works? All right, let me give you another example in a completely different industry. Let's say you sell life insurance. We train tons of companies, thousands of agents in this space as well. Train every industry in the world now, supposedly. Every freaking industry. Let's say you sell life insurance. I'm going to show you a completely different industry, same exact structure. I want you to see how, how this works. It almost sounds similar, okay? Yeah, I just, you know, um, I just really need to talk uh, with, you know, with my spouse on this. Yeah, that's not a problem. How does your spouse feel about you guys having the stronger financial protection to be able to, to pay for all the, all the expenses in the house when something happens to you? See how I'm associating the same thing? Completely different industry. Same structure. See how it works? Yeah, that's not a problem. How does your spouse feel about you having the stronger financial protection to make sure the home and all these other expenses are paid for when something does happen to you? Notice how I'm repeating I'm associating the money with getting what they want, okay? Then they're going to answer, well, I think they would want me to do it. Okay, but, but what happens, and this is where you show concern and empathy. You lean in. Okay, but what happens if you go to him and he doesn't want you to put the extra funds into the bigger policy, you don't have the protection, and then something, God forbid, happens? What would they do then? Oh gosh, I, I don't know. I just have to figure it out. <sighs> I understand. Um, but what would he do though if you pass away? Let's say not even now. What happens if you pass away 15 years early and then he gets stuck with having to pay the mortgage and all the other bills, but he doesn't have enough money to do it? Like what would happen to him at that point? Prospect, I don't know. I, I just hope that doesn't happen. Well, you tell me, which is more risky for you guys? Is it more risky for you to get the extra funds together to be able to double your, your protection with all of that cash? And so when something does happen to you, your family and kids are 100% protected? Or is it more risky for you guys to do nothing at all and then something happens, God forbid, because no one knows, something happens to you and then at that point, you know, your wife has to go out and get a second job. Which is more risky? See the concern I lean in? Ah, yeah, I, I, I need to, I, I, know, I know we need to do something uh, about this. Okay, but, but, but why now though? Okay, but why do this now? Like, why not push it down the road like a lot of people would and then something bad happens and they don't have the policy? Why do this now? Why not wait and see if something happens? See that? Okay, but why, why look at doing this now? Like, why not push it down the road like a lot of people do and then something tragic happens? 
oh my gosh, I need to do... Okay, and they start to give you reasons. Well, what do you think you should do then? And a lot of times you can wrap it up there. Now, if you still can't wrap it up, if they're like, I need to talk with my spouse, you follow the same formula I just gave you, the calendar commitment close, you book the appointment, and then before you leave, it's the same thing. Now, hey, before I leave, what, what parts have we went over today do you feel like you need to really talk with your spouse about, just so I know what questions you have when we talk in two days? Well, I just really need to get with her and, and really talk about where we're going to pull this extra, you know, $150 a, a month out of. I just, you know, and then we find out it's a money objection. Now I know it's a money objection and I, and I can help them overcome that objection while I'm there and most of the time close it. Worst case scenario, I have a booked scheduled appointment. Okay. Now that's life insurance, completely different industry than what I showed you before. Let me give you a completely different industry so you can see how it works and do it in B2B sales. Very similar format, but there's a little bit of tweaking. Let's say in this example that you sell some type of lead services. Okay, we train lots of companies in this as well. Let's say that you sell some type of marketing, consulting, or you even sell, let's say you even sell social media. You're like a social media agency. You, you basically do their marketing for them or you teach them how to do the marketing so they can get a higher quality lead. I'm just throwing out different industries there. And let's say that you mainly sell to small business owners, so it's more of an SMB sale. Same exact structure, different wording a little bit. Okay, now if you sell to large enterprise accounts in B2B, we will tweak it even a bit from that structure. I don't have time to go through that right now, but there are some tweaks on that. Okay, I'll see if I have time, all right? Prospect says, ah, you know, this really sounds good, Alice, but I'm gonna have to speak with my, my two other, my business partner, my CEO, uh, probably even my CFO to really get their thoughts on, on, on this and what we should do. Okay, because there's, mo there's multiple decision makers there. You're not just talking to a spouse, okay? And once again, I'm just giving you an example, SMB. If you sell large enterprise accounts, it's a little bit different because there's more than likely seven, eight, nine, ten different decision makers or influencers. SMB depends on the industry. There might be three, four, five, a little bit less, so there's a little bit you can get away with here. Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, tell me, how does your business partner feel about you guys getting a higher more quality lead to your sales team so they sell more for you guys. Notice how I'm plugging in what they said they wanted, a higher quality lead so they can, what's the end result? Make more sales. You see what I'm doing? If they can get the funding, they get what they want. If they can't get the funding, they don't get what they want. Remember, people don't buy your product or service. They buy the results that your product or service gets them. You're not selling a product or service, you're selling the results of what that product or service does for them, period. Once you learn that, selling becomes very easy. Well, you have to write, have to have the right questioning, but that's the, the generalized idea, okay? Prospect says, well, yeah, I mean, they would, they would want leads for sure. I mean, who wouldn't want it? more leads and, and better leads? Well, what are you gonna do though if you go to them and they don't understand what we went over, they don't understand some of the challenges your salespeople are telling you they're having, and they don't want you to get the extra funding to get the higher quality lead. And like you mentioned, your sales keep stagnating the next three, six, even 12 months. Like what happens to you guys then? And you say that in a skeptical tone. That's a consequence question to get the prospect to realize what the ramifications and consequences are if they don't do anything about this. Prospect, yeah, we'd have to do something for sure, otherwise uh, we'd be in a lot of hurt by then. Now, here's the difference with B2B compared to B2C. Most of the time, it is better for you to set up another appointment to meet the other decision makers than trying to ram this down this guy's throat or gal's throat here. Because typically in a B2B situation, unless it's like a mom and pop laundromat and there's two business owners and they're the only employees of the company, that's different than if you're talking with some type of company that has 100, 200, 500,000 employees or more. There typically are rules that their company has to follow, going through the board, going through legal. There's different things and processes they have to go through. So if you try to completely hard close them, you're going to lose about 99% of those deals here. So you got to, it's a little, you got, it's, it just takes more steps to get it to that point. So what you want to do is 
Well, um, okay, so, uh, so what are you going to do? Yeah, I'd have to do something for sure we could go under. Well, would it help you if we set up uh, another call with your business partner and your CFO and both of us kind of discuss some of the challenges and problems that you had mentioned to us you're having and then how we could actually solve each one of those so you guys could scale. I think you'd mentioned you want to get to 100 million in revenue next year. Would that help you if I, if I was willing to set up another call with them and you? See, I position myself, status frame. Would that help you, okay? Now, especially if they have a business partner, other decision makers in a B2B environment, you want the other decision makers on that call. Okay. Yeah, that would actually help us actually. Well, uh, and then it's the calendar commitment. Well, what I can do, if you have your calendar handy, I can pull up mine and have you guys book a specific time with me, uh, probably a little bit later this week. I'm, I'm pretty wrapped up in the next few days. Uh, that way you guys don't have to chase me down and vice versa. Would that be appropriate? And then you book a scheduled appointment. Now at the end, I might get off and say, now when you go and talk with your business partners about you know, actually being on this call, what do you think they're going to say? Now, I want to know that because I want to know if they have like, oh, you know, Ed, you know, CFO, he's always skeptical about these things. I need to know how to resolve that with that person. Or yeah, Cindy, yeah, the department head, she hates these type of sales calls. I'm going to have to convince her. I want to know that right then and there, not hope that they get them on there and then they don't show up or I get an email saying, we couldn't get them on, we'll have to get back with you later on. You don't want to do that. So, okay, so let's say that you go to them uh, and start, what do you think you should say to get them to even want to be on this call though? Well, I would say about this and I'd say about that and let's say they start talking about features and benefits. You don't want that. Well, you could say that. Um, can I make a suggestion though? Yeah, sure, go ahead. What if you started talking to them about some of the same challenges you were talking with me about, about the lead quality's gone down and you've lost about 20% of your sales force over the last six months and you're concerned that you're gonna lose another 20% and how we might have something that could really boost your lead quality up where you can start getting more attractive talent back. What if you started talking with them about some of those things? Would that help them more, better understand it? Oh, for sure, that's a really good idea. See how I'm positioning that person to talk with the other decision makers or influencers to actually give, get them to the call, not just show up some, some other sales call they think is going on, okay?